Hello and welcome back to the fifth chapter of Lambda Calculus and Types. Today we're going to discover the last system before we can form the lambda cube. It's called lambda p. So far we've talked about three differently typed lambda calculi where we introduced three different dependencies. Terms depending on terms in the simply typed lambda calculus, terms depending on types in lambda 2, and in weak omega the newest concept, types depending on types. Obviously we're missing one dependency, types depending on terms. And this is what we're going to explore in this system lambda p. A dependent type is basically an indexed family or bundle of types that varies depending on the elements of another type. So we have a certain type b which represents a family of sets. Let's say the set of all multiples of a certain number. And if this b now gets an index n, this b n would be the type of all multiples of n. Now where does this n come from? Well in our small example, it would be a church numeral, maybe. But in general, it's just some term x of some type a. So we map a term x of type a to a type bx. In the lambda calculus, this is realized by abstracting over the type b and making this b dependent on a term of x of type a. Pi x of type a dot b. Since we abstract from a type and not a term, we need to use the pi binder that we introduced in lambda 2 instead of the lambda binder. The abstraction depends on a term and returns a type, so we have a type depending on a term. This abstraction is a constructor like the ones we introduced in weak omega and has kind a to star, since it takes a term of type a and returns a type. An interesting observation is what happens if the type b doesn't actually vary with x. This is true for whenever the x doesn't occur as a free variable in b. For every term of type a, the term returns something of type b. In that case, the pi abstraction is equivalent to the arrow type mapping a to b. So the arrow type that we know from previous systems is simply a special case of these pi types. From now on, we're going to drop the arrow types and use the constant pi types instead to handle dependent types more uniformly. It can be a bit difficult to form meaningful lambda terms when looking at the system in the context of mathematical functions, but it's very intuitive for logic or when working with constructs like lists. A very simple example was already mentioned. We might want, for every input number n, a type for all multiples of this number. Or another intuitive example is a list that contains elements of an arbitrary type, but exclusively that type. So we might construct a type constructor for lists that depends on an input term and returns the type for lists of integers or strings and so on. Another example is a list of a certain length. Such a type constructor for lists of a certain length would have the kind natural number to star. It takes natural numbers, like 1 or 35, and returns the type for lists of that length. This is very useful for creating a type for a function like append. This function takes numbers m and n and lists of corresponding lengths and returns the type for a list of length m plus n. Dependent types are used in functional programming languages like agda, closure, coq, and so on. Let's now look at the derivation rules for our new system lambda p that includes dependent types. We're going to start with the rules from the system lambda weak omega and change a few to get lambda p. In fact, there's only a few minor adjustments required. Types depending on types needs to go and types depending on terms needs to be introduced. The sort rule stays the same. The variable rule doesn't deal with dependent types, so it does need to be adjusted and the same holds for the conversion rule. The only three rules that do contain dependent types and need to be adjusted are the formation, application, and abstraction rule. The formation rule allows us to derive that a to b is type or kind if a and b on their own are also type or kind. a and b need to have the same sort s, which is then also the sort for a to b. This is the derivation rule that allows abstraction over types in the case that s is box. Okay, let's write down the rule with box. The first premise is gamma yields a of type box, and the second is gamma yields b of type box. Then we can conclude gamma yields a to b is also of type box. The simplest form that a and b can take is star. We get then that star to star is box. This star to star is the kind of a constructor, of a proper constructor. So its inhabitant will be a type depending on a type, which is not allowed in lambda p. So we need to forbid a from being a kind it can only be a type. As we observed in the introduction, in lambda p, this mapping from a to b doesn't have to be constant, so we need a variable x of type a which we abstract over. 
and we also have to exchange a to b with the pi abstraction, pi x of type a dot b. So we get the following rule for lambda p. If our context yields a to be a type, and with a given inhabitant x of type a, also that b is a type or a kind, then we can conclude that the abstraction of x over b is also a type or a kind. So this rule then gives us the actual type abstraction as well as the kinds of such an abstraction, like a to star. The other two rules are a bit easier to adjust. In the application rule, we just need to replace the arrow a to b in the first premise with a pi type. So if we have a term m of the dependent type pi x of type a dot b and another term n of type a, we can conclude that the application of m to n is of type b, where each x is substituted by n. Lastly, we have to consider the abstraction rule. Once again, we have to change the arrow types and arrow kinds to pi types and pi kinds. This makes it possible to refer to the variable x that is bound by the lambda also from within the type b, instead of only having constant types. So to get to the derivation rules of lambda p, we start with all derivation rules of lambda weak omega. And then we change the formation rule, the application rule, and the abstraction rule. So to conclude this short video, the system lambda p adds the last missing type term dependency, types depending on terms, which means that a type constructor can take a term as an input and return a new type. This so-called pi type generalizes the arrow types that we used in every other system. One of the great things about types is that they allow you to encode properties of your program at the type level, so that they're enforced by the type checker. Violating these properties will result in a compiler error. Although the calculus doesn't have more computational power than the simply typed lambda calculus, just like lambda weak omega didn't, dependent types allow you to express many properties that you can't express in type systems without dependent types, such as associating a list with its length. There are obviously much more sophisticated things you can do when programming in a dependently typed programming language, but we're not going to go into detail about this here. If you're curious about how dependent types can be used in the quote-unquote real world, we encourage that you check out the Idris programming language. There's another amazing feature of dependent types, which draws a fundamental connection between basic computation and logical reasoning. We're going to explore this in chapter 7. With this video, we conclude the overview over the extensions of the simply typed lambda calculus, and we can finally analyze the lambda cube and give a uniform definition for all those systems that we discovered. Thank you very much for watching, and see you in the next video.